Dit is Daily Minutes Extra Bits nummer 5 met column nummer 3. Deze uitzending begint met een column uit de serie over krimis. Daarna volgt deel 5 van de serie over zelfbouw. De Daily Minutes Extra Bits zijn extra uitzendingen van de Daily Minutes... die bedoeld zijn om de overgang van PI2 NOS naar internet op 30 september gladjes te laten verlopen. Ik heb even gedacht dat de Daily Minutes als Daily Minutes Extra Bits op internet zou doorgaan... maar dat plan is zo goed als zeker afgeschoten. Het uitzenden van de Daily Minutes en de lange uitzending via YouTube gaat best goed... hoewel het technisch redelijk gecompliceerd is en er nogal wat hobbeltjes zijn... Uh, ik heb bijvoorbeeld maar één computer op het moment waarop het programma Open Broadcaster zonder problemen werkt. De oorzaak is dat er in de andere systemen grafische chips zitten die ouder zijn dan een paar jaar. Het gaat met de open source niet commerciële social media server, wat een mondvol, <laughs> woka.be, uh, niet woka woka, maar woka.be, erg boven verwachting. Ja, wat staat er nou? Het, het, gaat, het gaat boven verwachting goed. Dat wil ik zeggen. Na ruim 24 uur waren er al 18 aanmeldingen voor deelnemers. Je kunt je uiteraard nog steeds aanmelden via www.wokka.be. Whisky, Oscar, Kilo, Kilo, Alpha, Punt, Bravo, Echo. De werking lijkt vrij veel op Twitter. En je kunt niet alleen mensen bereiken op deze ene server, maar ook op andere aangesloten servers. Zoals bijvoorbeeld Mastodon.social en AFU.social, waarbij AFU staat voor Amateurfunk. We beginnen nu dus met deel 3 over de krimis en daarna deel 5 uit de serie over zelfbouw. Aan het eind van deze extra bits in het Engels, het GB2RS nieuws van vandaag in de versie van TX Factor. Zoals deze via PI2 NOS niet kan worden uitgezonden vanwege de muziek die eronder zit. Deel 3 van de Duitse krimi. Ruiniker kwam via producent Herbert Ringelman in contact met het werken voor televisie. Beide, geïnspireerd door het werk van Francis Durbridge, besloten ze voor de Duitse markt in dat genre televisieprogramma's te gaan maken. Durbridge schreef vanaf 1938 een aantal boeken over detective Paul Temple, die in datzelfde jaar tot een reeks zeer succesvolle hoorspelen werden bewerkt. De hoorspelen waren vanaf 1939 in het Nederlands bij de Avro te horen onder de naam Paul Vlaanderen. Deze hoorspelserie liep in Nederland tot 1969, terwijl er in 1998 ter gelegenheid van het 75-jarig bestaan van de AVRO nog een nieuw verhaal werd opgenomen. Ook werd er in 2004 nog een verhaal uit 1948, waarvan de opname niet bewaard was gebleven, opnieuw uitgevoerd. In Duitsland was de hoorspelserie onder de oorspronkelijke naam van Paul Tempel even succesvol. De samenwerking tussen Reineker en Ringelman resulteerde in de series Deer Commissar en Dirk, terwijl daarnaast ook het concept van Siska door het duo werd uitgewerkt. Series als Dirk, Der Alte en Ein Fout für Zwei werden uitgezonden door de ZDF. Deze tweede Duitse tv-zender startte op 1 april 1963 met de komst van extra etenruimte van de UHF-band als concurrentie voor het eerste Duitse net ARD. Zowel het eerste als het tweede Duitse net zijn publieke zenders met beperkte tijd voor televisiereclame. Beide zenders zijn zeer verschillend van organisatorische opzet. De ZDF is een van de grootste tv-conglomeraten van Europa, terwijl de ARD bestaat uit nu negen zelfstandige organisaties uit de verschillende boerdersländern, de bondstaten waaruit de Bondsrepubliek Duitsland bestaat. De ARD had al eerder succesvolle misdaadseries gehad in de vorm van bijvoorbeeld Staalnet, dat tot 1968 liep, maar zocht naar een goede opvolger hiervoor die bovendien een sterke concurrent zou zijn voor de commissaris die op dat moment bij dit ZDF liep. Terwijl de zdf krimis dat zijn er inmiddels behoorlijk wat verschillende, dus in opdracht van één organisatie gemaakt worden, worden de tatortvolgen, de tatortafleveringen, dus door steeds verschillende organisaties geproduceerd. Elk participerend boendesland heeft op die manier gewoonlijk dus zijn eigen tatortcommissar. Vrijwel altijd spelen de afleveringen zich ook in een bepaalde stad af in de betreffende bondstaat. Voor Horst Schimanski is dat bijvoorbeeld Duisburg in de bondstaat Noord-Rijnland-Westfalen, die tegen de Nederlandse grens aan ligt. Behalve Duitse bondstaten doet ook Oostenrijk met tatort mee, net als tussen 1990 en 2001 Zwitserland. Ja, dit is deel 5 van de serie over zelfbouw. Ik heb zelfs nog voordat ik voorzichtig wat op 27 op 7 ging doen, flink wat met deze optimist schakeling geëxperimenteerd. Zo vertelde ik vorige keer al. Eenvoudig beginnen, dat is natuurlijk altijd belangrijk. Ik ben overigens begonnen, zoals veel mensen denk ik, met de bekende EE-bouwdozen van Philips. Volgens mij was het eerste dat ik buiten dit bouwpakket om op een stukje wereldboord maakte een morsetoongenerator, een sounder dus. Ik had voordat ik ook maar begon overigens al een 19 set sleutel die ik van de vader van een klasgenoot kocht. Die vader was luisteramateur, maar deed er niet heel veel meer mee. Ik heb al eens op een middag in de zomervakantie bij hen op zolder vrijwel de gehele middag op een oude scheepvaart ontvangen naar verschillende amateurbanden zitten luisteren. Op een moment overigens dat daar vanwege slechte condities zo wat niets te ontvangen was. Het gebrek aan hoorbare amateurs op dat moment kon me overigens niet ontmoedigen.
Maar dat te zijde, eenvoudig beginnen, ik zei het al, dat is belangrijk als je gaat zelf bouwen. Een microfoonversterker is bijvoorbeeld zo'n project om het zelf te proberen, net als een morsensounder natuurlijk. Maar een microfoon zal meer mensen aanspreken tegenwoordig. Eventuele brokken die je daarbij maakt, die zijn in de meeste gevallen niet ernstig en de kans op succes is groot. Bovendien kun je vrij eenvoudig door een al dan niet regelbare tooncorrectie te introduceren je modulatie er een stuk mee verbeteren. Een niet-automatische antenne-tuner is ook zo'n gemakkelijk en goedkoop te bouwen uh, eerste project. Zeker als je het is voor zendvermogens onder de bijvoorbeeld 30 watt. Je kunt die gebruiken met een SWR-meter die je al hebt. Of je kunt zelf een indicator maken die ofwel de maximale antennestroom aangeeft of de minimale SWR bij de beste aanpassing. Antennestroom kan bij QRP-vermogens bijvoorbeeld door tijdelijk een ouderwets fietslampje in serie met de antenne-uitgang te zetten en dan op maximaal licht te tunen. Na afstemmen moet het lampje weer overbrugd worden om niet een deel van je zendvermogen in licht om te zetten. Het hoeft dus niet veel te kosten, zeker als je één of twee afstemcondensatoren uit een oude radio kunt gebruiken die je al hebt en als je de spoel met aftakkingen zelf wikkelt. Met een dergelijke tuner kun je al antennes afstemmen die met de meeste automatische tuners dus niet lukken. Voor een antenne-tuner hoef je doorgaans geen printplaten of zo te maken, hooguit als je een heel net gemaakte SWR-meter aan de tuner wil toevoegen. Dat hoeft ook niet per se in een behuizing of een metalen kast of zo. Ik heb zelf een longwire tuner met een condensator uit een oude radio en een rolspoel die gewoon open en bloot op een houten plank is gemaakt. Met vier rubberen dopjes eronder dat hij niet van de tafel schuift. Antennes zijn zeer zeker heel dankbaar als bouwproject omdat je makkelijk resultaat haalt en zonder veel kennis of vaardigheid al iets kunt maken dat enorm bevredigend werkt. Dat geldt met name op HF voor draadantennes bijvoorbeeld, maar een dipool of een halve golf voor 50 of 70 MHz of een HB9CV voor 2 meter is ook heel gemakkelijk te maken. Een ground plane is ook zeer eenvoudig, ideaal als tweede antenne of om naar signalen uit de ruimte zoals het ISS te luisteren. Voedingen worden ook vaak als beginnersproject genoemd, maar ik vind dat een minder geschikt apparaat. Met een voeding kun je als je niet goed soldeert of de zaak mechanisch niet goed opzet, dan kun je heel veel kwaad mee aandoen. En hij kan je dure zendontvanger die erop aangesloten is bijvoorbeeld vernielen. Een verkeerd gemaakte voeding kan daarnaast ook brandgevaarlijk zijn. Ik had het gisteren nog over de Poljakov mixer, genoemd naar de Rus Poljakov, die de schakeling voor de DC ontvanger uitvond. Twee van de problemen met de DC ontvanger, de direct conversion ontvanger, zoals ik gisteren al, worden veroorzaakt door detectie van audio op de oscillatorfrequentie, waarin in het ene geval brom en in het andere geval microfonie, het geluid uit de check, uh, mechanisch geluid uit de ontvanger zelf, terug de ontvanger in worden geleid, wat tot rondzingen kan leiden. Een Poljakov mixer bestaat uit twee antiparallel geschakelde diodes, waarbij de mixer zelf het oscillatorsignaal in frequentie verdubbelt. Zodoende bevinden zich de modulatie van de microfonie en de eventuele bron uit opnieuw gemoduleerd oscillatorsignaal op de halve frequentie van de ontvangstfrequentie. En zodoende worden ze als ze dan toch uitgestraald worden sterk onderdrukt. Hallo, ik Bob McCready, G0FGX en dit is de TX Talk podcast van de GB2 RS News van de Radio Society of Great Britain voor zondag 23rd of september 2018. Our news headlines, railways on the air this weekend, planning permission guide update for RSGB members and the RSGB operating advisory service pages now online. This weekend is Railways on the Air and many clubs will be operating special event stations from railway-related sites around the country. It celebrates the anniversary of the first steam-powered passenger railway that launched on the 27th of September 1825. The first passenger train ran on a line in the northeast of England from Darlington to Stockland, which is why Bishop Auckland ARC coordinates this event. You can find a list of the participating call signs at Rota. Dot barrack dot org dot uk. So that's r o t a dot b a r a c dot org dot uk. The RSGB's Planning Advisory Committee will be launching its latest planning guide for members at the National Hamfest on Friday, the 28th of September. Now, in its ninth edition and edited by PAC Chairman John Mattox, Gulf 4 Tango Echo Quebec, this popular guide draws on John's many years as a professional planning inspector and the work of the RSGB Planning Advisory Committee. The guide has been updated to reflect recent changes in the planning system and includes advice on making planning applications, enforcement notices and also appeals for amateur radio aerials and masts. A limited number of printed copies of the new RSGB Planning Guide will be available from the RSGB planning booth at the National Hamfest and it will be available as a downloadable PDF for RSGB members from the 28th of September on the RSGB website. That of course is rsgb.org 
and slash PAC to get you straight to the right page. That's rsgb.org.pac. The Operating Advisory Service, OAS, is an RSGB volunteer-run service that provides guidance to licensed radio amateurs in the UK and the Crown Dependencies of Jersey, Guernsey and the Isle of Man. It helps promote good practice and advises on how to manage problematic behaviour and poor operating practice on the amateur bands. The initial OAS pages are now on the RSGB website at rsgb.org slash OAS. Reg Woolley, Golf 8, Victor Hotel India, is looking for an additional newsreader to help when he's unavailable due to his work shift pattern. His newsreading covers the Midlands area and he uses both 2 metres and 70 centimetres. If you're interested, could you please email gb2rs at rsgb.org.uk. The National Hamfest takes place in Newark on the 28th and 29th of September at the George Stevenson Pavilion, Newark and Nottingham Showground, Lincoln Road, Winthorpe, Newark. The postcode is November Golf 24 to November Yankee. On Saturday the 29th, the National Club of the Year Trophies 2017 will be presented with thanks to Waters and Stanton for their sponsorship of this competition. Details and tickets, of course, from nationalhamfest.org.uk. The RSGB board has decided to make changes to the way in which nominated board directors are appointed. The RSGB board is made up of eight directors, one is the elected president and four are directly nominated and elected by membership ballot. A further three directors are nominated by the RSGB nominations committee for endorsement by the membership at the AGM. The role of the committee is to identify areas where the knowledge and skills of the board members may need further support and to find suitable candidates. Primarily, they are looking for business skills and not those directly associated with amateur radio. Further details are on page 10 of the October Radcom, and if you feel you have skills that could be of benefit to the RSGB board, please get in touch by email to company.secretary at rsgb.org. UK. company.secretary at rsgb.org.uk The RSGB convention takes place from the 12th to the 14th of October. This is at Kent's Hill Park Training and Conference Centre in Milton Keynes. Our thanks to the principal sponsor, Martin Lynch and Sons, and you can see the whole convention lecture programme at rsgb.org slash convention. Visitors will be pleased to know that Jim Bacon, Golf 3 Yankee Lima Alpha, will be speaking with a lecture entitled Sporadic E Revisited, Is it any clearer? Sporadic E is a complex propagation mode, so Jim will start with a review of where we are with current understanding of sporadic E, ideal for the many newcomers to amateur radio. VHF Balance, Fact and Fancy by Ian White, Golf Mike 3, Sierra Echo Kilo, shows how our ideas about HF Balance have changed dramatically in recent years. Now Ian extends those ideas into the VHF and UHF spectrum, taking a critical look at some long-established methods for feeding Yagi antennas and identifying a new list of do's and don'ts for modern conditions. Keith Haynes, Golf 3, Whiskey Romeo Oscar, has recently decided for personal reasons to step down as an RSGB board director. Keith was co-opted to the board following his proposal by the nominations committee and took on the liaison responsibilities of the RSGB awards and regional team. We wish Keith well for the future and thank him for his contribution to the RSGB in the many roles he has undertaken. Those attending the RSGB convention gala dinner on Saturday the 13th can reserve tables for groups. And if you want to do that, you need to email radcom at rsgb.org.uk with the names and call signs, if appropriate, of those wishing to share a table. And the organisers will take care of the details. So that address again is radcom at rsgb.org.uk. Next for you, we've got the details of rallies and events for the coming week. On the 28th and 29th of September, as already mentioned, the National Ham Fest is at the Newark and Nottinghamshire showground. The venue has free car parking and disabled facilities. There will be trade stands, a bring and buy, a car boot area, flea market and special interest groups and a huge RSGB bookstore. There will also be representatives from the RSGB services and committees. Morse proficiency tests will be available too and the venue does have catering outlets and a seating area. More details at nationalhamfest.org.uk. On Sunday, the 30th of September, the Pencoed ARC tabletop sale takes place. This happens at Pencoed Rugby Football Club, the Verlands, Falindra Road, Pencoed, and the postcode is Charlie Foxtrot 355 Papa Bravo. Tables are £10 each on a first come, first served basis. Doors open at 8am for sellers and 9.30 for buyers, and admission 
is two pounds. Hot and cold drinks are available, with hot food available in the morning and at lunchtime. Madeline Roberts can tell you more on 0773 837 5775. 0773 837 5775. Also on the 30th, the Belgium Amateur Radio and Computer Rally takes place. And this is in Louvre Expo in La Louvière. There is direct access from the motorway. It's about 50 kilometres south of Brussels. Open from 9am, there is talk-in on local FM repeaters on 145 600. There's also a huge 400 square metre exhibition space, trade stands from the UK, Holland, Germany and France, and a flea market. You'll find more at on6ll.be on6ll.be and get your event into radcom and onto gb2rs just send the details as early as possible to radcom at rsgb.org.uk Next, we have the DX News. This is from 425 DX News and other sources. And we start with Chris, Victor Echo 6, Charlie Mike Victor. He's going to be active in the CQ Worldwide RTTY contest on the 28th and 29th of September as Victor Oscar 2, Victor Charlie, which is CQ Zone 2, Labrador. He will be operating in the low power single op on 20 metres using a delta loop antenna and just 100 watts. Outside of the contest, he will be active from the 27th of September to the 4th of October on 80 through to 6 metres SSB, RTTY and FT8. QSL to his home call, which is Victor Echo 6, Charlie Mike Victor, as per QRZ.com. Victor Whiskey Bravo Zero Tango Echo Victor and Scott Kilo 5 Papa Sierra are going to be active as Victor 31 Victor Papa and Victor 31 CQ, respectively, from Black Man Eddie in central Belize from the 27th of September to the 2nd of October. They'll operate SSB and RTTY and will participate in the CQ Worldwide DX RTTY contest. QSL Victor 31 Victor Papa via Club Logs OQRS or via Whiskey Bravo Zero Tango Echo Victor Direct or via the Bureau. And QSL Victor 31 CQ via Logbook of the World Club Logs Logs OQRS or via Kilo 5 Papa Sierra Direct or via the Bureau. Stu, Kilo 4 Mike India Lima is going to be active as Kilo Golf 4 Sierra Sierra from Guantanamo Bay from the 25th of September to the 9th of October. He's going to operate RTTY, including in the CQ Worldwide DX RTTY contest. Also on FT8 in Fox and Hound mode and CW. QSL via Logbook of the World are direct to Kilo 4 Mike India Lima. The NBDX team are going to be active as Hotel Bravo Zero slash Oscar November 4 Alpha November November from Liechtenstein on the 24th to the 28th of September. And QSL for that is via Mike Zero URX's OQRS. So that's Mike Zero URX and his OQRS. Special event news now and celebrating 100 years of the RAF. GB100 RAF is going to be operating from the Air Defence Radar Museum at RAF Neatshead in Norfolk on the 23rd. QSL cards require an SAE only to RAFARS, RAF Cosford, Whiskey Victor 73, Echo X-Ray and RAFARS, of course, is R-A-F-A-R-S. North Bristol ARC has been invited by Avon Valley Railway to set up two stations on the 23rd, one station from within an operational train. The main HF station will be using Golf Bravo Zero Alpha Victor Romeo on the 20, 40 and 80 metre bands and a portable station will operate from the train using QRP on 20 and 17 metres as well as via GB3BS and gb 7 BS. Remember, we're very happy to publicise your event on GB2RS in Radcom and on the RSGB website. Just send details to radcom at rsgb.org.uk as early as possible. One condition for getting a special event call sign is the station must be open to the public, so our free publicity can help make your efforts more widely known. Contest news next, and over this weekend, the UK NEI Contest Club DX Contest ends its 24-hour run at 1200 UTC on the 23rd. This uses SSB on the 3.5 to 28 MHz bands. The exchange is signal report, serial number and district code. Also Sunday the 23rd, the Practical Wireless 70 MHz contest runs from 1200 to 1600 UTC. This uses all modes. The exchange is signal report, serial number 
and locator. On Tuesday, the SHF UJK activity contest runs from 18.30 to 22.30. This uses all modes on the 2.3 to 10 gigahertz bands and the exchange's signal report, serial number and locator. On Wednesday, the UK NDI contest club runs from 2000 to 2100. UTC, of course, using CW only. The exchange is your four-character locator square. And on Thursday, the 80-metre autumn series contest runs from 1900 to 2130. UTC, using data only, the exchange is signal report and serial number. Next weekend, from 0000 UTC on the 29th to 2359 UTC on the 30th, the CQ Worldwide DXRTTY contest takes place using the 3.5 to 28 MHz bands, and the exchange for that will be RST and Zone, which for the UK is 14. On the 30th, the UK Microwave Group's contest will run from 0600 to 1800 UTC. This is on the 5.7 and 10 gigahertz bands, the exchange signal report, serial number and locator. Finally, we come to the radio propagation report compiled by Golf 0, Kilo Yankee Alpha, Golf 3, Yankee Lima Alpha and Golf 4, Bravo Alpha Oscar on Friday the 21st of September 2018. Firstly, the sunspot reported a few weeks ago as possibly being from the new sunspot cycle 25 turned out, in fact, to be from cycle 24. Although it had a reverse magnetic polarity signature than other cycle 24 spots, scientists now say that its low solar latitude means it wasn't from the new cycle. Scientists are also now predicting that sunspot minimum may be in September 2019. So we can expect poor conditions to last for some time yet. Over this last week, the solar flux index was pegged pretty much at 68. Geomagnetic conditions were mainly settled in the latter half of the week, with the K index zero at times. Next week, NOAA predicts the solar flux index will remain in the range 68 to 69. Geomagnetic conditions are forecast to be poor on Sunday the 23rd and Monday the 24th due to a small coronal hole that will contribute to the high-speed solar wind. Expect the K index to reach at least four, with conditions improving as the week progresses. Uh, we're now moving into the autumnal propagation season, so we can expect to see modest rises in maximum usable frequencies, perhaps passing 18 and even 21 megahertz at times. Now let's take a look at the VHF and up propagation news. This weekend looks to be in the grip of unsettled weather with more strong winds possible. One model puts a deep low over southern England on Sunday with the potential for very strong winds in the south. Another model doesn't develop this strong feature, so check the forecast regularly and make sure your antennas are secure. There is better news for the coming week as high pressure is expected to return to bring more settled conditions, giving a chance for tropo to develop. The overnight and early morning autumn mists are a good weather clue for tropo conditions since they indicate cool moist air near the surface overlain by warmer dry air above. In this contrast of moisture is the major contribution to changes in the refractive index of the air and hence ducting or tropo. The moon is past apogee now and declination goes positive on Tuesday meaning increasingly longer moon windows and decreasing EME path losses as the week progresses. There's a light meteor shower peaking next Saturday. The daytime sextantids is not well known to visual observers as its radiant lies close to the sun meaning trails are only visible during the last couple of hours before dawn. Meteor rates are very low so nothing to get excited about from the meteor scatter point of view. And that's it from the propagation team for this week and remember if you want to read a full transcript of this news broadcast you will find it on the rsgb website under news to hear the local news for your area then tune into the amateur radio station that provides that service for your area or you will also find a transcript on the rsgb website i'm bob mccready g0 fgx and this has been the tx talk podcast of the gb2 rs news from the radio society of great britain Right after this, we have for you a column by Chris Golf 7 Delta November November, musician and ham radio operator, which provoked a lot of discussion amongst amateur operators all around the world. My own opinion is not necessarily the same as the author's, but for discussion's sake it is always good to hear another person's opinion, so that's why we bring it here. The column was originally brought by The Rain Report, www.therainreport.org. There you can listen to it, and a link and the complete text can also be found on www.papaalpha0echotangoecho.nl. I'm Larry McGlore, KB9DIP, with the March 24th Rain Report Hamcast. When one hears a discussion about amateur radios interfacing with digital technology, like Echolink, 
JT-65, FT-8, and even Riddy, invariably some diehard 80-meter redneck has nothing better to say than, Ah, that's not real ham radio. So just what is real ham radio? For a European perspective, we turn to Chris Rollinson, G7DDN. Chris recently penned and voiced a commentary addressing this question. It's not real ham radio by Chris, G7DDN. I was musing recently on the wonderful history of amateur radio from the early pioneers with spark transmitters and the race to get the first signals across the Atlantic, all the way up to the microwave enthusiasts who developed the way forward for space communications and satellite technology, and uh, whisper this, yes, mobile phone technology too. The history of ham radio and RF technology is inextricably linked. There was even a time here in the UK where it was believed, anecdotally at least, that a ham radio call sign could help you to get a job with the BBC. However... Change came very quickly, relatively speaking, in the early history of radio. From Marconi's experiments to the first public broadcast stations was only 25 or so years, and TV was only another 15 years or so behind that, and so on. Yet the history of ham radio is also one of resistance to change, not from the pioneers, they were often the instigators of it, but from the everyday hams. Let me see if I can give you some examples with my tongue planted very firmly in my cheek. The early hams used CW pretty much exclusively, so when AM arrived as one of the first of the voice modes, there was a bit of an uproar. It's not real ham radio! Real ham radio involves using a Morse key! What on the world is the hobby coming to? Using voice to communicate over the airwaves? It's sacrilege! But life went on. AM found acceptance, and all was well in hamland once again. Then transistor technology arrived in the late 1940s and early 1950s, provoking quite a response. Hang on, that's not real ham radio. Real ham radio is glow in the dark. We can't be having this miniature technology. They'll never last as long as valves or be as reliable. But life went on. Solid state devices found acceptance and all was well in hamland once again. Then SSB arrived and there was more discontent. That's not real ham radio. Real ham radios don't sound like Donald Duck. (laughs) It's a fad. It'll soon fall away once people get fed up of hearing those silly voices. But life went on. SSB found acceptance and all was well in hamland once again. Then FM and repeaters arrived. And there was polarisation within the hobby, and it wasn't horizontal or vertical I'm talking about either. That's not real ham radio. Real ham radio doesn't need to use that thing on top of that hill to help your signal get somewhere. Real ham radio is point to point. But life went on. FM and repeaters found acceptance, and all was well in hamland once again. Then packet radio arrived, and there was real trouble. That's not real ham radio. Real ham radio doesn't need one of those newfangled computer thingies in order to work. Get your key out, get your mic out and start working other hams properly. But life went on. Packet radio found acceptance and all was well in hamland once again. Then Digimodes arrived and there was yet more strife. That's not real ham radio. Real ham radio doesn't involve typing messages to other hams and those perishing computers again. What on earth are they doing in our hobby? But life went on. Digimodes found acceptance and all was well in hamland once again. Then digital voice modes arrived and there were some very serious disagreements. That's not real ham radio. Real ham radios don't sound like (laughs) R2-D2. Real ham radios don't use the internet to help them get round the world. They absolutely have to use atmospheric propagation. What is happening to this hobby? But life went on. D-Star and other digital voice modes found acceptance, and all was well in hamland once again. Then we arrive at today, and network radios come on the scene. And all hell breaks loose. That's not real ham radio. This is playing at ham radio. There's no amateur RF, so it simply isn't ham radio. What's more, I worked hard for my licence and everyone else should have to too. How dare people enjoy communications in an incorrect manner? So, will life go on and will all ever be well in hamland once again? 
It's the 21st century challenge. This is why the advent of network radios represents such a challenge to us as hams. It's causing us to completely rethink what it means to be a radio amateur in 2018 and beyond. And we will have to start facing up to questions similar to these. What exactly defines a radio amateur? What do we mean by amateur RF? Is it RF generated by someone who is an amateur? Or is it RF generated on a particular band allocated to us by government? If so, does it absolutely have to be that? Can it be nothing else? Or does any of all this really matter anyway? And what about our bands? As hams, we're very attached to our bands. Whether it's 160 metres or 2 metres, we almost have a psychological sense of ownership of them. We have favourite bands... We have bands we never frequent. We even have our spot frequencies. And you know as well as I that some hams will get somewhat assertive if a fellow amateur is not a member of their group dares to use their frequency. And yet, in the 21st century, I believe this whole concept of bands and frequencies could be becoming ever more fluid. Why would this be? The most important thing is to keep our minds and our thinking wide open. We shouldn't just reject something out of hand just because it's new, or just because it challenges our own preconceived ideas of where radio should go. Equally, we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater and reject traditional ham radio as it has been for years. Surely the ionosphere and the internet are complementary and not in competition. If you've listened this far and you haven't switched off, and you really want my personal thoughts, why can't we have the best of both worlds? Surely we can. Network radios, at this stage in their development at least, are not contest radios, for example, and the internet is not yet a contest-friendly mode of propagation. That might change, of course. So contesting, for example, is still best on the traditional handbands. I'll see you on 80 metres. 59001, old man. However, regular, reliable, high-quality contacts around the world are but one thing that network radios excel at. So why not just use that when you want to? or when the HF bands are so full of noise, or are otherwise dead. I do. I don't see the expansion of choice in the hobby as a bad thing. To me, enjoyment is the key. Does the fact that I'm transmitting on a cellular frequency at, say, 800 MHz, 900, 1800, 2100 MHz, or perhaps even on Wi-Fi at 2.4 GHz or 5 GHz, does that matter? Is there something intrinsically evil about that? Is it more virtuous to use 21 MHz or 432 MHz, for example? They're just frequencies, after all. I prefer to see myself following the motto of my local radio club. Having fun with RF. Whether I choose to use a network radio or a a yay com wood super-duper base station is not really as relevant to me. Enjoyment of the hobby is everything. Otherwise, why have a hobby? Whichever way this debate goes and whichever direction this great hobby takes, my line would be to keep all the richness of every aspect of the hobby. In other words, to go back to the title of this piece and change but one word, it's all real ham radio. Thanks for listening. I'm Chris Rollinson, G7DDN. This has been a commentary written and voiced by British ham... Chris Rollinson, G7DDN. You'll find a written copy of Chris's commentary on his website, g7ddn.com, and click on articles. Chris happens to be a musician, and he has a new album, Piano Reflections, now available on iTunes, Google Play Music, and Amazon Music. He also has a YouTube channel.